Hey, I'm golf broadcaster Matt Adams, the updated and expanded second edition of my book, The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments, is now available. Readers can expect to march with Arnie's Army at the 1960 U.S. Open, relive Jack Nicklaus's remarkable 1986 Masters win, and be amazed by the Tiger Slam. The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments. Pick it up where fine books are sold, including barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. This Day in Sports History. Well, hello, and welcome to another edition of This Day in Sports History. It's April 24th, and on this day in 1963, the Boston Celtics won their fifth consecutive NBA championship, and it was the final game for Bob Cousy as a Celtic. The fact that Cousy was a Boston Celtic to begin with is an interesting story. After being a consensus first-team All-American at Holy Cross his senior year, which is located in Worcester, Mass., and Boston with the first pick in the NBA draft, Celtic fans were loudly suggesting that Cousy should be that pick. But Red Auerbach had other ideas, selecting big man Charlie Scher out of Bowling Green instead. And when asked why he didn't select Cousy, he said, Am I supposed to win or please the local yokels? Yeah, Auerbach was not a Cousy fan. He'd seen him play at Holy Cross, and the flashy style that Cousy played was a turnoff for him and many around the league. Now, this was the old, staid, conservative NBA. No shot clock, no three-point shot, and it was about as vanilla a game as you could find. One scout wrote of Cousy, the first time he tries that fancy stuff in the league, they'll cram the ball down his throat. So instead, Cousy was chosen by the Tri-City Blackhawks, a team that he really didn't want to play for. This was a team in the Midwest of Iowa, and at the time, Cousy was trying to set up a business in Worcester, and he didn't want to relocate to the Corn Belt. So he told the Tri-City's owner he wanted $10,000 to play for the team that season. The owner offered six. Cousy held out. At that point, the Chicago Stags picked him up, but then that franchise folded. So the NBA commissioner said three players, Max Soslowski, Andy Phillip, and Cousy would be placed in a dispersal draft. The Celtics were one of three teams invited, and the last player that owner Walter Brown wanted was Bob Cousy, and yet that's the name he pulled out of a hat. Afterwards, Brown confessed I could have fallen to the floor. But that's how Bob Cousy became a Celtic. And it wasn't long before both Auerbach and Brown would realize just how wrong they had been about the kid. Cousy played 13 years in the league and was an all-star in every one of them. He was the league MVP in 1957. He led the league in assists eight straight years from 1953 to 1960. And there are some who credit Cousy's style on the court for actually saving the game, adding some spice to a flavorless league. Though, still not everybody appreciated it. Cousy said he got a lot of letters from high school basketball coaches around the country who were upset because of the example he was setting with his ball handling and passing. It seemed that every guard in the country wanted to play like the Houdini of the hardwood. From 1957 until Cousy's departure in 63, the Celtics dominated the league with six championships. Of course, Bill Russell and Tommy Heinsohn had a hand in those banners going in the rafters as well. But without a man to get them the ball in the way he did, would they have been as successful? He officially announced his retirement a month later on May 17th in what was known as the Boston Tear Party. Now, while I said this was his last game as a Celtic, it wasn't his last game in the NBA. While he was the head coach of the Cincinnati Royals in 1970, he inserted himself as a player in the final seven games of the season, playing about five minutes a game and averaging less than a point. So really nothing to talk about, which is why we highlight this night as the last game that Bob Cousy played as a Boston Celtic. Also on this day in 1945, Happy Chandler was voted in as the new commissioner of Major League Baseball by the owners. And we talked about the immediate impact that he made on baseball in the April 15th edition when he eliminated the rule not allowing black players to play in the majors, opening the door for Jackie Robinson and others. 
Chandler is widely viewed as the most influential commissioner in the history of Major League Baseball. In 1901, it was the first game ever played in the American League between the Chicago White Stockings and the Cleveland Blues. The American League was an eight-team league, but just as happened with the National League when it debuted 25 years prior, all but one of the games was rained out. Chicago won 8-2 on this day and went on to win the American League pennant that season. In 1994, the Admiral David Robinson poured in a career-best 71 points. And as I talked about a few days ago with David Thompson and George Gervin locked in a tight battle for the scoring title, that was the story with this one. It was the final game of the 94 regular season, and Robinson's San Antonio Spurs were playing the L.A. Clippers. Robinson and Shaquille O'Neal were the two battling it out for the scoring crown. Earlier in the day, Shaq Diesel had put up 32 points against the Nets. With the advantage of playing later in the day, the Spurs fed Robinson at every opportunity. And then, just to make sure, Spurs coach John Lucas had his team foul the Clippers in the final minute to give Robinson even more opportunities. He scored seven in the final 60 seconds of the game to give him 71 and the scoring title, averaging 29.8 points a game to Shaq's 29.3. And on this day in 2004, the San Diego Chargers selected Eli Manning with the first pick in the NFL draft, despite the fact that Manning expressly told the Chargers not to pick him. He was a Charger for about 45 minutes, and then he was traded to the New York Giants for Phillip Rivers, who had been taken with the fourth pick. And here's today's non-sports did you know. In Iowa, you can legally own butter substitutes, but it is illegal to pass off anything but real butter as butter. That's all for today. I'll have more tomorrow on This Day in Sports History. This has been an original Thrive Suite production. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know that. Can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sports. HistoryNetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.